everyone, and welcome to Silver so Around About Games. Contrary to popular opinion, or indeed what your lying ears may tell you, this is a board gaming podcast about board games. I am your co-host, Mark Bigney, and with me is my dear friend, Michael Walker. How are you doing, Walker? Great. I am back from Ottawa. I had to go for a bat mitzvah. I was not present for the full Megillah, either literally or figuratively. I was there for part of the Megillah, both literally and figuratively. And as everyone knows, I love to travel. And I love spending time with family, so it was a grand old time. A win-win. It was absolutely a win-win. However, I can attest that the most important part, well, to me anyway, I mean, sure, there was, it was a great religious significance. The speech was actually pretty good, but it was the kosher Chinese food that I was there for. The kosher egg rolls, the kosher Admiral Chicken, not to be confused with General Tao's chicken, and it was spelled C-H-I-C-K apostrophe U-N, that kind of chicken. Gotcha. Delightful. Delightful. Anyway, we're going to be talking about board games this week. We're going to mix things up. We're going to talk about the games we played last week. We're going to talk about the news and why it doesn't matter. And then we're going to talk about our feature game, which is Leonardo da Vinci's Codex Lester. Spelt L-E-I-C-E-S-T-E-R. Very much like Worcestershire sauce, which is pronounced Worcester sauce. I used to live in Boston, so I'm very familiar with these kinds of pronunciations. You're going to get a lot of trouble. Really? A lot of trouble. Okay, sorry. A pronunciation. <laughs> generally, sometimes heard at... Just start chopping out syllables until That's it right. comes out the way you want it exactly. to. Exactly. So, Walker, what did you play last week? Mark, we streamed Street Masters, because it's on Kickstarter right now, because Steamforged is putting it out. It was a uh, Blacklist Games. Now it's Steamforged. They're redoing everything, plus some extra, so we thought we would play a game so people would... Did we play it? I don't know. It played us. But um We can't win every game. Walker. I know. No, I appreciate board. it. It it was it was a great example of a co-op loss. I can see kind of what we did wrong. I played some cards I shouldn't have. We we misjudged the tempo of things. We misjudged the amount of engagement we needed to do both for the minions and for the boss. And the fact that it was so quick was largely a testament to the fact that we were playing against the Golden Dragons. Now, which boss you choose and which stage you choose will determine a lot of the tempo of a game as dynamic and variable as Street Masters. And we chose a boss who's heavy on the offense, light on hit points, and so you're going to win or lose relatively quickly compared to other factions. Yeah, and saying we chose, there was an app we Mark downloaded it and applied it in seconds quicker than it would have taken us to actually choose what we wanted. Yeah, just randomize the stage and the villain. Normally we have no different difficulty choosing the fighter we wish to play. But as far as the enemy factions go, we're perfectly happy to let the whims of fate go uh, or, or make our own decisions. So what did you think of the uh, fighter you chose? I believe this has been your perennial favorite fighter. Yeah, I played quite a few. I like, you know, the bears and the pandas and the silly ones. Once when in, in while. doubt, when in doubt, choose bear. But, that is true. But when, you know, when it comes down to it, yeah. we were streaming, we had to look good. So it was bring, bring <laughs> trying to put the silliness away. Yeah, put the silliness aside okay. and and bring out the big guns. Yeah. Well, yeah, you played Gabriel, a uh, a Brazilian judoka who does a whole bunch of uh, joint locks and other jujitsu type things. And enjoys watching his opponent be in pain. It's true. It's true. Yeah. You had some hand management issues. I did. Which is a function of the character. He plays yeah. a lot of cards in sequence. He yes. did. It was the it was it was result of the first draw, right? He, he, he sort of had those cards where you dumped your hand and he got them all at the beginning, mm. unfortunately. Yeah, and I was a support character who I'd been meaning to try, and she specializes in giving a po- giving her uh, fellow colleagues healing effects and movement effects, not so much card draw. In hindsight, had we been choosing fighters synergistically, which we tend not to do, uh, but we could if we wanted to, I should have chosen the support character who gives more card draw. That would have helped you out considerably. As it happens, also, Huey, who joined us, also had a very bad initial draw, which was kind of unfortunate, so he took a while to get going. So card draw would have been doubly useful for, to that extent. So this can be compared quite heavily to Sentinels of the Multiverse, where you you know play a card, do an action, draw a card type thing. But the the big difference is, where in Sentinels of the Multiverse, there's a big villain turn, and you have to go through all their cards and make sure you don't forget anything. The very interesting and fun difference in Street Masters is that at the beginning of your turn, you're flipping over sort of a boss card or a stage card, or and it it comes into your area. So which means that at the end of Every one of your turns, you have to run that card. And so it sort of splits it up and doesn't collate it all into one giant, you know, slows, keeps the tempo going. Absolutely. Additionally, the targeting considerations are not as obtuse and fiddly as the targeting considerations in Sentinels. Typically speaking, something, now make no mistake, 
we're big fans of Sentinels of the Multiverse. But the target effects tend to be something like the non-hero target with the second highest hit points or things like that. And you're like, oh, oh come on. And you're just looking around all the cards and telling things. We're willing to do it, but it's definitely not the best part of the game. Meanwhile, in Street Masters, the map actually makes the game less fiddly. Because there's the spatial location, it makes it easier to apply, which is usually the, the reverse of how things normally work. A car- an enemy will target something that's adjacent to it. There you go. Done. Or the nearest one. There you are. <laughs> so it's easier to apply and leads to better decision space. Yeah. Speaking of decisions, that's the other part of it as well. In Sentinels Multiverse, usually you're just targeting the thing that's causing most trouble. Where this, you're taking into consideration the timing effects. It's like, well, right. if we attack this one now, then on the next player's turn, it'll be destroyed. Therefore, it won't activate. So it's a lot, a lot more things to think of. I actually spent a few hours this weekend playing side-scrolling beat-em-ups with a friend of mine. And it is meant to be evocative of side-scrolling beat-em-ups, which is one of my favorite genre of video games, and I'm glad it's having a bit of a resurgence lately. Unfortunately, a lot of the cultural references in Street Masters are of competitive fighters. And yes, I'm being ridiculously snobbish in terms of insisting that there's a difference between the two. They're very different games, uh, but such such is the way of things. There are nods to things like a couple nods here and there to Final Fight, a couple of nods to Double Dragon, but as it is. Now, I just want to stress now, I'm going to be talking about Street Masters again later in the news. I retract what I said in the news last week. I actually scrubbed it from the episode, but some people heard it too early. I mistakenly implied, more on this later, that Street Masters 2 on Kickstarter currently, which it was Street Masters after Aftershock, it is now being rebranded as Street Masters 2, was a good entry point to the series. It is not. It is not a standalone version by virtue of the absence of the dice and like six tokens, which is unfortunate because I think it has the best content. So I will be redoing my buyer's guide, but in a more abbreviated version come the news. But suffice to say, Huey and I are happy to play Street Masters in any given opportunity. I think it's safe to say that you're slightly less enthusiastic, but still still keen on the, on the product. I agree with that. Fair enough. So that was Street Masters. We streamed it. You can find it on our YouTube page. Under the live tab. Under the live tab. We get to play the Barracks Emperors. This is a review copy sent to us by the publisher. This is a sort of bizarre take on trick-taking that is a riff on Time of Crisis, the card-driven sort of troops on a map game by Ray Farrell and Brad Johnson, also published by GMT Games. But here the the theming is just, well, there were a whole bunch of emperors, most of them murdered by their uh, father or their troops or their father's troops or something. Some of them got to die of natural causes, or as we like to call them, the lucky ones. And you're just competing. They're just, they're just points to be scored. And the conceit of the game is that in the Barracks Emperors, you set out a board in a checkerboard pattern. And you play your square cards between the other squares that are the things you're competing over. But you only play to one of the four cardinal directions. So say I'm playing to the north and Walker is playing to the south. I play my card to the north of one card, but that card in turn means that it is south of something else. That effectively is then Walker's card, whether he wants it to be or not. For that particular emperor. For that particular emperor. For that particular scoring opportunity. And so the timing, and all these tricks are happening simultaneously, effectively. So the timing considerations are, well, I need to play there before somebody else plays there. Slash, I need to be careful that when playing this way, I don't hand something to somebody else, which is already brain-bending enough. And then you add the special powers on top of all this, and then your brain starts dribbling out your ear. But I really appreciate what it's doing. I think the Barracks Emperors is one of the most clever riffs on trick-taking uh, that I've seen in the past 10, 20 years. In, keep in mind, the past five years have seen an explosion of novel takes on trick-taking. Yeah, there's so many little, like, I don't think we're going to go over everything. But just to get back to that example, because whatever card wins that particular trick is removed. So in the case where Mark played a nice big card to his south, but was great for my north, that doesn't actually work that way, but sure. let's just say, then I could finish that particular north emperor before Mark finishes his south emperor it's by true. using the card that Mark uh, played. I might be and, inadvertently setting you up to do that, and, and then my card's gone. That's right, and because I won it, that card is now removed, and that, so that card that Mark played is now removed, and he's no longer winning that other emperor. It's, and and. And indeed, my, my little verbal slip-up, my card, 
the moment it leaves your hand, it's not your card anymore. And this trips people up all the time. It's like, but but my card. It's like, wasn't your card. <laughs> yeah. It was your card when it was in your hand. The moment you played it, it now belongs to Rome. <laughs> and that happens mostly like when you when you initially play it. At least for me, it's like, okay, I got this big card. I'm going to play it. That means I win, right? Because I played it there. <laughs> Even though that's not my spot. But it's, right. but it's my spot this way. Do I? Not? It's a corner of your spot. Yeah. It's kind of your spot. And all of the cards have special abilities. Yep. So they all do crazy outlandish things. As long as you go in at the beginning knowing that, it's You, you do have to know that. So there are a bunch of cards that discard other cards or move cards around or car- cause card to be, cards to be flipped over or to be covered by something else. You just have to appreciate that that's going to happen. On top of the fact that people are going to be messing with your plans by showing up in, in the space that you thought was yours but turns out belonged to Rome, or getting rid of the card that you thought was yours but turns out belonged to Rome or whatever, and then suddenly a mobile Vulgus shows up and, and they start throwing confetti all over your plans. And- yeah, and, and, if you, and if you really look, they don't just show up because they all cycle through the 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 drafting so you'll be able to see them come up so you know it's coming i never you know i never watch that but if you really if it really bothers you you can keep an eye on it to know what's going to come up i suppose i i've been thinking about that actually there's so much information about what is entering people's hands even if you could make a perfectly uh, perfectly updated track of who's got what and when, I don't think that would help you to a considerable degree. And indeed, people who are inclined to do that tracking may get find the Bear's Emperor is very frustrating. Because say I know, for example, that you have a mob. A mob is, is a card that will burn another card that's out in play. I don't know who you're going to use that to target. And maybe then the logic is don't tussle with Walker. It's impossible to stay out of each other's way in the Barracks Emperors. That's one of its strengths. You're constantly in everyone else's face. And even if I'm able to remember, Walker picked up a mob a couple turns ago. Well, somebody else picked up a Mobile Vulgus two turns ago, and somebody else just picked up a Barbarian that could be used to cover something else. So now the logic is don't mess with anybody. Can't be done. So at that point, I mean, as far as I'm concerned, granted, I, I, I invoke this kind of logic and this paradigm and these heuristics very often in games. The Barracks Emperors for me is one of those games where you ride through the chaos and accept the fact that you're going to be messing with people and be messed with to a considerable degree. If you have zero tolerance for special powers that mess with you, I don't think you're going to enjoy the Barracks Emperors. If you have some tolerance for it, though, it could be hit or miss. But if you mostly if you're willing to appreciate how incredibly clever the design is, I absolutely encourage you to try the Barracks Emperors. I think it's more clever than it is enjoyable, but I still think it's really enjoyable, which is to say it's supremely clever. Yeah, this is super surface because there's so much going on. There's, yes. There's making sure your hand is full of some barbarians near the end because once you hit a certain point, i.e. the deck runs out, then all of the cards are removed and you're left with what's in your hand. And if you can't play a card, then that round ends. And not only are barbarians good for that, barbarians are very powerful near the end of that round. It's true. It's true. It's a it's a dynamic map. It's dyma- dynamic spacing. It's dynamic powers. It's It's really, really, really well done. And most of the time, even clever trick-taking games after about the one hour mark i'm like "Mm, can we move on because frequently trick-taking games because of the variance of card draw tend to have a lot of rounds or they end up they can end up feeling arbitrary the barracks empress is a solid 90 to 120 minutes and i'm completely engaged the entire time Uh, largely because as i say the the dynamics of the map are such that it's sufficiently fluid that you 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 never really you're never really fighting on on a given front and by virtue of the fact that despite the fact that, you know, I keep talking about it in terms of trick-taking, but so many of the conventions are upended. Like, there's no notion of following suit. There's no notion of voiding a hand. There's no notion of leading a card, really, because, again, you're playing simultaneously across all these different areas. And I think that's one of the reasons why I don't mind the fact that it is easily twice as long as, as other trick-taking games that, that I would normally enjoy. Yeah, I thought it was. A, it goes three rounds. I thought maybe two would be fine. I'll have to play it more. I only played it the one time, so I'll have to see. All right. Unfortunately, it is very inflexible with respect to player count. Yes, there's a solo variant. I haven't tried the solo variant. And you can, in theory, play with two or three, but... I... No, I'm going well, to get into this later with another game. This is a game that is four-player only. Yes, yes. And we are seldom at four. We are vastly more often at two, three, and five. Uh, but anytime we are at four, I'm happy to keep the Barracks Emperors in the mix. So that's the Barracks Emperors by Ray Farrell and Brad Johnson, published by GMT Games. So I played a lot of Dune this week. 
because I picked up a copy of Dune Imperium Uprising. And for some reason, I thought the app on Steam was also Uprising. It is not. It is the standard Dune Imperium. But I enjoyed going through games of that because they went so quickly. But it just doubled down on what I didn't like about it the first time we played it. Whereas the combat was very swingy. The game is sort of just based around the combat. Like, because everything else is just resource gathering. You're getting spices, you're getting water, you're getting influence. So it's sort of like worker placement, the resource gathering game, right? And then it's based around this combat where some people just happen to have cards. So you're wasting actions, getting cubes out, and then someone drew the card that gets them plus seven. So that whole round is wasted. And I really feel that the with the one game, let's let's be sure that I only played Dune Uprising once. Uh, the way they changed the intrigue cards, the way they changed the conflict cards, I think made a big difference. Oh, good. The the early conflict cards don't have as many victory points on them, so you're playing for other things. The deck has much more useful cards. The fact that you can uh, bring worms into combat and protect some areas is is much better. The board is sort of mixed up. You have this whole spy mechanism where you're putting out spies that are connected to different uh, worker placement spots, which also which not only allow you to go there when there's other workers there, it will allow you to draw more cards. So there's lots of changes to uh, Uprising, which hmm. I think did a great job. Just so you know, it's it's just like a, it's the unupdated version, I guess you could say, of Dune Imperium. They just sort of took all the input and sort of put out a new game. And they say it's uh, compatible with all the expansions. I read through the rules and, you know, it's, it tells you what you need to pull out or do all these different things in order mm. to get the expansions to work. But I enjoyed Dune Uprising and I would play it again. I guess I'd try it. It's all put out by Direwolf. Direwolf puts out a ton of board game expansions and they also put out the board games for this particular brand. Dune Uprising and Dune Imperium is designed by Paul Drennan and, like I said, put out by Dire Wolf. I confess I'd be slightly more enthusiastic if it was the David Lynch Dune. It's just like we say about bears, right? Yeah. If you can go bear, go bear. If you can go sting, go sting. That's my view on Dune. Anyway. <laughs> I Don't worry. If, if you think that m my takes on science fiction are already abominable, wait for the news segment. I'm going to say something that's going to lose us all of our listeners. Sweet. Each and every one. I'm going to play Tank Duel Enemy in the Crosshairs. This is by Mike Bardicelli and published by GMT Games a few years ago. This is a card-driven game of tank combat that is very much riffing on an Avalon Hill game called Upfront. Upfront was published in the early 80s, and they called it the squad leader card game. And that is true only in the sense that there are squad leaders in there, and it's a card game, but it does not bear any salient resemblance to the squad leader chit-based tactical war game. But anyway, setting all that aside. Uh, Upfront was very interesting in how it abstracted away the map. It was one of the very early games to say, what can we do with, with distance and spatiality without an actual map? And so the range was entirely abstracted. So not entirely unlike what we say about Doomrock or uh, games like Through the Ages that say, well, this is traditionally bogged down in things like hexes. and other, well, well, How can we reimagine the space here? And what both Tank Duel and Upfront did is they just say, look, we care about your theoretical distance from the other part. Parties, we're not going to make you represent it specifically on the map. It's like, I am at range 800 meters from the center of the battlefield. Oh, you're at range 600 meters? We're 1,400 meters away. There we go. That's all that matters. I respect that. It, le it leads to a degree of cleanliness and focus, and Tank Duel actually implements it in a way that is vastly more intuitively obvious than Upfront was, because Upfront, although a very clever and interesting game, is not what you would call intuitive or with a very particular possible rule set. And I acquired Tank Duel Enemy in the Crosshairs again. I'd had a copy before. I talked about it on the show a few years ago. Because I realized that this is the kind of thing that Louis might enjoy. Louis is, shall we say, obsessed with the tanks. He has a long-standing enthousi enthusiasm for them. And I thought that it's something he would really appreciate. And sure enough, it was a thing that he really appreciated. We'd comment about, oh, this thing happens. Like, well, you know, the, the T-34 was a diesel engine rather than a petrol engine. And so this makes perfect sense. I'm like, I don't think that's what they were modeling, but I'm glad you like it, Louis. <laughs> <laughs> now, Tank Duel is a strange experience in my in in my view. So, for one thing, I have yet to find a scenario that I really find interesting because 
The sort of default scenario in Upfront is about subjecting yourself to an unsafe range and holding ground there. And if you do that, you win. That's the sort of intro scenario. Indeed, a lot of people never progress past that. There are people who have been playing Upfront for 40 years and have never played anything of the first scenario. Played Suicide Mission every time? Gotcha. More or less. More or less. Tank Duel's basic scenario doesn't have any impetus to hold ground. There was something that happened near the middle of our game. We played 2v2, and it allows multiplayer much better than Upfront, than Upfront did. Upfront is strictly a two-player game. But in Tank Duel, it's just, hey, everybody gets a tank, or everybody gets multiple tanks, uh, go to town. And it's very flexible in that sense, and I appreciated that element. But here's what happened. You get points for kills, and that's about it. That is about it, especially in the first scenario. And the Germans had uh, blowed up uh, a, a Soviet tank, and then they ran away. They just ran to the, the far end of, uh, of the map, too far for anyone to really hit each other. And I was worried that they had internalized that if they stayed at that range, they could just wait out the clock and win. <laughs> because they had, they had points. We didn't. No, they ran away for, 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 for a, a sort of tactical retreat, and then they re-engaged. Re-engaging was the A, fun call, but B, not the smart one. <laughs> in part because of another concern I have with Tank Duel, in that there hasn't been a whole lot of effort made to balance much of anything. I'm not talking about, you know, things around the margins like, oh, I found an exploit. I'm just talking about, again, a game that is driven primarily by kills. Every German kill will award far more points to the Soviets than every Soviet kill will to the Germans, just by virtue of how the tanks work, because you get points for every crew member you kill and for every vehicle you destroy. The German tanks have more crew in them. There you go. So the Germans have to have to destroy roughly one and a half times as many tanks as the, the Soviets do, all things being equal. Now you might say, okay, well, why don't you fiddle with the tank matchups to solve that? Okay, well, then, then you have another problem. If you care about balance at all, there's not a whole heck of a lot of guidance as to what tanks you should use to face off against each other. Now this, I can attribute to a certain mindset about historical wargaming. Why should I tell you what's balanced? Just do what's historical. Find two main battle tanks of 1940 and have them smash up against each other. Uh, okay, but the game is already super gamey. Like, Tank Duel Enemy of the Crosshairs is already a super abstracted, super almost arcadey representation of Tank Cobb anyway. So why are you then at the point where I'm asking for a balanced scenario or specific details, throwing up your hands and saying, oh, I'll figure it out in the context of history? That's kind of weird. And I don't think it's a conscious cop-out, but as somebody who is not particularly interested in the ins and outs of tank combat specifically, as a gamer, it feels a little bit like a cop-out. And I realize I'm a bit of a marginal case in the context of, you know, your GMT consumer base or your historical war game consumer base generally. Were we playing a Napoleonic game? Were we playing, you know, successors or anything like that? I might care more about these details, but I don't. And so I find the absence of guidance for a gamer a little galling. Anyhow, it was very enjoyable. Here's the strange, here's the strangest thing about Tank Tool Enemy in the Crosshairs. The fire resolution procedure, just firing your main gun, if you hit an enemy tank, it is a multi-step procedure of pulling various cards for various factors. And rather than being cumbersome, it's really enjoyable. One of the funnest things in Tank Duel Enemy in the Crosshairs is just going through the mechanical processes of blowing up an enemy tank or finding out what happened. It's like, oh, I hit you on the turret. Ooh, does my armor penetrate you? Well, at this range, my gun has an armor penetration rating of seven and you have an armor rating of six. Okay, let's see if I penetrate. Ooh, I did penetrate you. Ooh, it's, a, it's critical damage. What does that mean? Oh, your engine done blowed up. Let's see what happens. And so it's, re it's really bizarre. Normally, games like this, it, it, it would feel like a cumbersome, sort of time-consuming, fiddly process. Somehow, Tank Duel Enemy in the Crosshairs manages to make this multi-step process enjoyable. Everyone is, is, is looking at the cards flip and seeing what happens. It's great. It's really cool. I, I kind of wish that they could apply this to something like a mech game, where, you know, again, you could really start getting into the, the, the ins and outs of weird systems and systems failing. Because as it is, you know, in the context of a tank manufactured in the 1940s, you know, your treads can crap out, your engine can blow up, and that's about it. You don't really have more esoteric functions that can happen. But if, if you're willing to, to go nuts on a more complicated machine, or maybe a game uh, featuring warship combat, I don't know where you could really exploit some of these more interesting possibilities. As it is, 
as I said, it's it's very fun to just have tanks smash up against each other. I kind of wish that they'd done a little bit more with it. And that's one of the reasons why, in the process of getting tanked to one, I mean, the crosshairs for Louis, I also got the expansion, which includes uh, North Africa, which includes more tanks for the Axis and some tanks for some of the non-totalitarian allied nations without going into more pointed detail than that. But the problem is there, they give even less guidance about what to do with all this. You know, they give you a scenario and they say, okay, well, here are the rough parameters. Here's how sand works. And then I'm like, okay, well, what forces lead to a fun matchup? And I'm like, I don't know. Take whatever tanks you want, man. It's like, Yikes. Yeah. So, look, there was a lot of enthusiasm for the process. It's a fun game to play. How long does it take, though? Is it? Oh, ni- 90 minutes. Okay. Four players playing tanks, 90 minutes. It's timed based on a certain number of times through the deck. You put a reshuffle card in in the bottom half of the deck, and every time it comes up, you reshuffle the deck. Eventually, you stop reshuffling, and you put the game end card somewhere in the deck. And it it leads to interesting attention and a little bit of deck manipulation, not entirely unlike upfront and combat commander. In terms of if you're winning, you want to burn through the deck as much as possible. If you're not winning, you want to be a little more conservative about how fast the, the deck is going. The hand management is really cool. It's one of those card games where you can't discard cards at will, so you have to start thinking about how you're going to get rid of these cards that you don't like to get better cards in, in, in your hand. Different tanks have different capabilities for movement and firing, and that in turn in, indicates what cards you can play. L- there's a lot right in Tank Duel Enemy in the Crosshairs, and if I knew more about tanks, I'd probably get a lot more satisfaction out of the way that it models these details, and I'd probably care less about the fact that it doesn't give me any guidance. Because quite frankly, it's like the analogy that I will use, and I realize this is highly personal, it's like a non-Macross fan looking at my collection of Macross Valkyries and being like, what differentiates the VF-171EX from the VF-17? It's like, oh, they're entirely different machines. What are you talking about? <laughs> anyway. And then four hours pass. Uh, and like that, that is the... <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I completely respect the fact that if a game involved Macross Valkyries and did a bad job of explaining to the user what goes on. Now, is it more defensible in the context of World War II tanks? Absolutely. Especially given the audience that GMT knows it has and the general interest level in the broad public about tanks. I, I'm just not there. I'm not in that audience. Anyway, so I it's it's also a shame because Tank Duel Enemy in the Crosshairs is one of those historical GMT games like the Barracks Emperors, like the Commands and Colors games, like a Charioteer, that could be a mass market game. It could be the kind of thing. Well, okay, sorry. Let me back up. Mass hobbyist game. <laughs> it could be in the slightly larger niche than the super tiny niche of historical war gamers. Uh, but uh, sadly, I think by virtue of a number of fundamental design commitments, it's not going to get out there. Now, I have a tank whisperer in the form of Louis. He's going to help me come up with possibly facially balanced matchups if we intend to keep exploring Tank Duel, which we very well might because people enjoyed it. So that is Tank Duel Enemy in the Crosshairs, designed by Mike Berticelli at GMT Games. Lastly, for me, we streamed Lunar Rush. This is designed by Stephen Skippy Brown and put out by Dead Alive Games. It is a review copy that was sort of facilitated by the Hungry Gamer. He also sort of chimed in on the stream to make sure we were doing everything fine and and got everything sort of set up for us. It is a great game. It's one of the games that I was most looking forward to getting back to. It is very, a part of it is very heads down working your own engine. But then they've put this main board in that does a great job of getting very strict sort of player interaction. You are choosing your routes to ship stuff up to the moon and ship refined goods back to earth. And some are fast and don't let you do very much, very many things. Some are slow and you can load them right up and picking these routes and, and, and trying to get player orders. So you get you know, the ones that you want is huge. So player interaction is great there. And then it switches over to totally heads down, <laughs> manipulating your, your, uh, your own engine. And much like the main game we're going to be talking about later on, it's about figuring out how many workers to get up there. Cause you have to, you have to feed all your workers and you have to ship them up there and you have to have room for them. And then you're manipulating all these goods. You're upgrading. See, the, upgrading your tableau, love that kind of thing. You're making all of these, you know, I think there's six different workstations that you have and you're making, you can upgrade them twice each. And then you're, you're, uh, making these gold workstations that are incredible. And the timing for that is very interesting too. It's the very first thing you have to purchase. That's before you manipulate any of your goods. So you have to make sure you're set up for that 
at the end of, you know, the, the, the previous turn. Anyway, I'm not going to go on and on about it. I very much enjoy Lunar Rush. It was uh, the second time I got to play it at four players. This is what I was talking about before. It is, people can say it's, you can play it with less. But then you have to do a bunch of card manipulation and AI stuff to to sort of close down routes and stuff. So, And there's so many games out there. So much like uh, Barracks of the Emperors, you would play it when you had four players. If you didn't have four players, there's many other games that play well at that. So same thing with Lunar Rush. I'd play it if I had four. Any other player count, I don't think I would. Mm. What I most liked about the about Lunar Rush was the general idea that they knew they were doing a relatively straightforward cube pusher, but there the added wrinkle of well, but we're going to care about where the cubes are. <laughs> getting the cubes to where you need them to be then becomes the interesting gameplay element because getting raw materials to the moon is the difficult part because you have as many raw materials as you want. Yeah, I love the part that they're it's just free. generated for free. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just do you have a boat that's big enough to take them? And you then alluded to the fact that you have to draft boats based on how fast they are and how big they are, and that you obviously want them to be as big as possible and as fast as possible, but you can't have both. Yeah, that that was the part that I found interesting. I was very disappointed by what they then did with the cube pushing, but that might have just been an aberrant draw. The game we played out of a combination of perhaps incompetence uh, or tunnel vision or perhaps just the, the availability of these gold modules made it so that they didn't seem especially appealing. But you reported to me that in this particular play, the gold modules were much more appealing. Yeah. All eight were purchased and used and, right. and used to great extent. And we there's all sorts of different modules you can pick. I think, uh, I keep forgetting what it's called. It's like the mo- you're building these great monuments on the moon. So you're drafting these three cards and you got to pour a bunch of resources in it. And they have all sorts of modifiers on how they score points at the end. That's always fun. And there's powers. There's going to be expansion coming out this year as well. So we can look forward to an expansion for Lunar Rush. There should be a tie-in expansion. So you could play Lunar Rush MD. Yes. That would be great. Because not enough games, not enough real-time cube pusher cooperative competitive games about zero-G medicine. Just so. Yes, I can see the niche market for that. Yeah, it's an underserved market. I agree. Played some more Regicide, always happy to play Regicide. I played solo, and I'd like to make a comment about what some of the chattering classes online like to say about Regicide. Because every time I bring up Regicide, there's a certain group of, what's a more polite term for jerks? People. Who always, but did you win, Mark? Yes, I did win this time with Regicide, because I was playing solo. Solo and two-player is easy. It's easy mode Regicide. Grown-ups win Regicide at three and four players. And I've done that too. But I don't have to go and crow about it every time it happens. It's going to be okay, Mark. It's going to be okay. I suppose it is. One of the reasons why I was encouraged to go back to Regicide is there's been information coming out in bits and pieces from Badgers from Mars about Regicide Legacy. And one of the things that they're doing in Regicide Legacy, it's going to sound like a small thing, but to me it's a big deal. They are using the same brilliant art style that you find in Regicide. And every character has a name. The character names are going to be on the cards in future versions. Oh, that's awesome. I can understand why they didn't do it. They wanted a certain minimalistic, you can use it as a standard deck of cards aesthetic for base game regicide. Uh, But I I have a soft spot in my heart for Peanut, the two of diamonds, who has lost us many a game. (laughs) In that, Peanut was the only one left. He tries so hard, though. He really does. Look, Peanut puts in their level best, but there's only so much that Peanut can do. And I'm very enthusiastic for what they're going to be doing with Regicide Legacy. Uh, Regicide is a review copy we got from Badgers from Mars, designed by Paul Abrahams, Luke Badger, and Andy Richdale. I, I have to say, I am perfectly willing to play Regicide solo. It is not not my preferred configuration. I prefer three or four players. I'm perfectly willing to play at two players, absolutely. But I prefer it three or four, uh, because I do appreciate that increased difficulty, and I appreciate the, the necessity of engaging in sort of subtle communication a la Hannaby, trying to find a dynamic with your partner without speaking of letting them know what you need or what you're able to do in support by virtue of your card plays. I appreciate that sort of subtlety. And those are the games we played last week. And now a brief break while we pay some bills. This episode is brought to you by the Spring Cleaning Champions, Manscaped. This season, make sure to groom your carpets and the drapes with the leaders in below-the-waist grooming. 
Clear out that winter bush with Manscaped's Lawnmower 5.0 and watch your confidence bloom like the springtime flowers. Embrace the season and join the 10 million men worldwide who trust Manscaped with our special offer. Go to manscaped.com and use code SOWRONGGAMES for 20% off plus free shipping. Whether you're looking to craft your signature look or clean up that neckline, Manscaped has the right tools for the job. Introducing the season's champ, the Lawnmower 5.0 Ultra. It features two interchangeable next-gen skin-safe blade heads, dual LED spotlights, and sleevers rejoice, it's waterproof and comes with a swank carrying case. Get 20% off and free shipping with the code SOWRONGGAMES at manscaped.com. That's 20% off and free shipping with the code SOWRONGGAMES at manscaped.com. Nothing like a little spring cleaning in your pants. And we're back. On to the news and why it doesn't matter. So, Walker, Modiphius is going to be publishing a Mass Effect board game. I heard you like Mass Effect. You have Mass Effect Risk. You, you, it's not as though we loved Mass Effect Risk. But the I, fact that it tied in... It, I enjoy Mass Effect Risk. I, I think it's actually re, a really good Risk variant. The theming is far better than the original trilogy theming. But anyway. I have no history with Mass Effect whatsoever. Yes, it's a, it's a, it's a bit of a shame. You're surrounded by a number of people who, yes. who absolutely adore so, Mass Effect. So when I said this to, to Louis, he was very excited. Sure. Uh, so here's the thing. Uh, it's going to be taking place during Mass Effect 3. Uh, I feel the need to confess that my feeling on the rankings of the Mass Effect games actually mirrors exactly my feelings on the rankings of the original Star Wars movies. In that hey, you are really... Yeah, yeah. I, I'm just going to bunch it all in. All because right. I, I'm just comment because a number of people have commented, oh, why does it take place during 3? Why doesn't it take place during 2? It takes place during Mass Effect 3 because Mass Effect 3 is the finest of the Mass Effect games. 3 was the best. One was the second best, and two was the least good. Still very good, but the least good. And for what it's worth, that is also my view of the original Star Wars movies. So, uh, now that all of you have uh, shut off your your <laughs> shut off your podcast in a rage, uh, the Mass Effect board game, furthermore, in addition to featuring all your favorite characters and being a great setting, is going to be designed by Eric Lang and Calvin Wong Tse Loon. That's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> so I am extremely excited. Also, uh, to sidestep another controversial issue, although on this controversy I don't really have a view, there will be miniatures available both for male shepherd and for female shepherd. Oh, there are people who feel very strongly about that. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm shepherd agnostic. I use gender neutral pronouns with referring to shepherd precisely because people have strong views, capital S, capital V. Anyway, Modiphius is a, a solid role-playing game publisher. Uh, they've done a number of board game adjacent things. They're not really known for their board games necessarily, but uh, I am very enthusiastic. So bring it on. This is a mark week for news because Ares Games has announced a partnership with the newly formed Dutch publisher, a board game developer, Colossus Games, to publish and distribute worldwide Mega Empires, a new line of civ building games. The line will debut with a revised edition of Western Empires and Eastern Empires, two colossal board games covering the development of ancient civilizations over 8,000 years of history, Mark. It's true. That's a lot of years. Yeah, and the game itself only takes 6,000 years. That's right. I say that from love. I love. So Mega Civ was released almost 10 years ago now, and then it was split up into Western Empires and Eastern Empires in part so that they could sell it for less than $300, and because they didn't have the rights to the name Civilization anymore. The changes to Western and Eastern Empires were truly marginal. They say they're making a couple of small changes now to this this third bite of the apple, as it were. So I'm not sure what gameplay changes will be done. I, I'm I'm perfectly happy with my Mega Civ. I don't know if there's going to be any gameplay changes that will really make me feel the need for these new versions, but I'm glad that they're going to be in wider distribution and hopefully they'll be slightly more affordable than the current versions are. Well, they said they're going to put in a bunch of different mega empires. Like they're going to have a like mega empire game line. Yeah. Well, whatever that means. Honestly, one of the best things about this is that it is getting more people talking about Francis Tresham. There you go. I mean that sincerely. Yeah. He deserves all the respect in the world and he is underappreciated in the hobby. So, uh, there's, <sighs> I'm conflicted Walker. <laughs> I'm very conf- So, Heroescape. Heroescape. Heroescape Age of Annihilation is the rebirth of Heroescape. It's going to be published by Renegade Games after the failure of Hasbro to crowdfund uh, through Haslabs the necessary $2 million they said they needed to publish it. They had to have it. They had to have $2 million, yeah. Look, Hasbro don't get out of bed for less than seven it's figures. True. It's It's pretty straightforward. So... 
The product line consists as follows. There is a new master set consisting of a whack of terrain. And for people who are new to HeroScape, the terrain is one of the key draws. It's these interlocking pieces that you can build these 3D terrain bits and the terrain really matters in HeroScape. High ground really matters. Insert your favorite Star Wars joke here. And 20 unique figures. And one thing that I genuinely appreciate about the design of the new figures in the new HeroScape is they really lean into the fact that HeroScape was always crazy and kind of stupid, silly awesome. We're going to have an orc warlord, but let's put him on a T-Rex. That kind of stupid awesome. Or let's have some cybernetic gorillas with guns. Uh, so the new set has, I think my favorite figure is the saber tooth tiger with bat wings and armor being ridden by somebody in bright red plate armor who himself has wings <laughs> and some sort of weird staff. It's, it's just, it's ridiculous. It's great. Now, the, the new master set will come in two versions. The unpainted one that will have a wash. We've seen a number of board games that come with a sort of a wash on them. Like Unmatched has a sort of a wash effect on their figures. A number of board game publishers do that. The, uh, the, uh, the washed version will is available for 125 American dollars, which is expensive. But the problem is that doesn't match existing HeroScape products. And if you're entirely new to HeroScape, the problem is, is that a single master set, although very enjoyable, it's a lot of money. The, the key enjoyment to HeroScape is when you have lots of army building options and lots of things being shoved at the wall. Back in the day when it was available in big box retail and you could get master sets for $40 and you could get expansions for $9.95 plus applicable taxes, it was an easy recommend, yes. right? Now, in order to build a HeroScape collection such that you could actually have all the fun army building and the madness and make new scenarios and big maps, we're talking about lots and lots and lots of dollars. And if you want the new master set to match your existing HeroScape stuff, and that is to say you want it to become painted, you want it to be pre-painted, Renegade's got you covered, which was an unknown quantity. We didn't know if they were going to have a pre-painted version, but the master set is going to cost $225. <laughs> That is a fair number of dollars, Walker. It is. That is many dollars. And especially since, if you're a longtime HeroScape collector, you probably don't need the terrain. Granted, a lot of terrain is becoming brittle and shattering, but you probably don't need a whole bunch more if, you're, if, if you've got a, a big collection. Now, to their credit, Renegade is also doing a smaller starter set with six figures and a whole bunch of terrain that is available for $45 in the washed version and $65 in the painted version. $65 is an eminently more reasonable prospect for pre-painted miniatures. And let me be very clear. I'm not saying that these prices are exorbitant. I'm merely saying that they are high. There's a difference between the two. But with only six figures, your options are even further comparatively limited. There's also a terrain set you can buy. There's also a terrain set a nice with some jungle pieces. Trees, exactly, yes. exactly. But that's that's strictly in the accessory sphere. And then I've clicked on purchase, and if you pre if you pre order, you also get a lieutenant free promo figure. You get a, a third version of of Sergeant yeah. Drake. I think he's Sergeant Drake Alexander. Yes. Uh, which is to say, he is probably one of the most straightforward hero escape heroes in the history of the line, in that he is merely a World War II paratrooper with a cybernetic arm, a jetpack, and a samurai sword. Yes. So, you know, comparatively banal. Just so. And the problem is a number of people ask, so, so should I get these things? I don't know who this is for, honestly. Because as somebody who has a lot of HeroScape, I'm looking at $225 and thinking, that's a lot more than I paid for any HeroScape product back in the day, and I have all this HeroScape stuff. I don't get to play it enough as it is. Should I really pay $225 just so I have more HeroScape stuff? Probably not. That's not the act of a smart man. And as somebody who has not already gone knee-deep into HeroScape, this, this product line, who knows how long it's going to last, right? If this is all they're going to they're gonna release... Again, because a lot of people are going to get sicker shock. Who knows how long this is going to be? Who knows if Renegade has even any plans? What their threshold might be? Maybe they will only be putting out more sets if they raise absurd quantities of money with this. Do I think that it makes sense to, to go all in at this point and spend $300 for 26 figures in a HeroScape collection? No. It's tough. And I realize that I keep banging on this drum, and it's not for everybody, and it's a bit of a stretch for a comparison, but if you want to get in and do miniatures on the cheap, well then, there's one-page rules and Gaslands. It can be done. 
this is not the way to do it if you want to do miniatures gaming on the cheap. And if you're a, a diehard Heroescape fan, I don't know if this is for you. It's weird. Yeah, I, it, I'm torn. I'm. I'm uh, yeah, well, yeah, it's not... <sighs> I think one of maybe the big hurdles is not in it's not sort of in the spirit of Heroescape. Mm. You know, it's sort of like you could you could almost introduce anyone to Heroescape. You yes, just, and they can go to the store and they, you know yep. if they liked it, they said, "Oh, that's cool." Yeah, you'd go to Toys R Us and you'd pay your forty dollars. Yeah, and they could bring it home and play it. Yeah, this this is not that. Yeah, you're right. That there's an odd sort of uh, a juxtaposition or even cognitive dissonance here. Expensive hobby product childlike joy of of toy dice chucking, right? Yeah. Those two don't really mesh together in my view. Uh and I don't know for how many people it will mesh together. It's 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 awkward and it's a bit of a shame because mostly mostly what I want is for the heyday of Hero Escape to be back to be back and then yeah. it never coming back. No. It's 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 unfortunate. So I I don't know if that vestigial enthusiasm will cause me to be irresponsible with my money. <laughs> it's I guess the upshot. So that's my view of what's going on with Hero Escape Age of Annihilation. On the topic of too much money for products coming out, the Street Masters Kickstarter. So, there's a lot of information on the Kickstarter page. There's a lot of products. Here's the lay of the land as it is. The way Steamforge Games has decided to repackage Street Masters into four Street Masters versions. Street Masters 1, which is everything from the first Kickstarter back in the day in 2018. Street Masters 2, which is everything from the Aftershock uh, expansion sets. Street Masters 3, which was a new standalone, which was crowdfunded on Indiegogo and has been in the purgatorial languishing of we didn't pay our bills for a while. And then there's Street Masters 4, which is just a new expansion. Street Masters 4 is not an entry point. Street Masters 1 and 3 are. One is very expensive, and it has some objectionable representations of women. They didn't have a full control at Blacklist Games on their art staff at the time, and so it's rather boob-heavy. Street Masters 3, nobody knows anything about. Street Masters 2 is my favorite of the sets, but it's not a standalone version. And so, again, it's an awkward product line to recommend. I can't really endorse Street Masters 3 because I don't know how good it is. Street Masters 1 is a lot of money, but it's a huge quantity of content. And it's good. It's solid. It's quality content. But the best stuff is kind of locked behind either getting Street Masters 1 and 2, which is a lot of money. At that point, you're spending well in excess of $250, which, again, seems to be a theme of these past two news items. And... If you go in for Street Masters 3, that's a bit of a gamble because, number one, the dollar for uh, the dollar per figure and content ratio is much worse. It's a lot cheaper, but you get a lot less stuff, and I, don't, I, I can't vouch for it. So it's tough. My recommendation is to read the rules and download the Android app if possible. All right? If, that is, if you have a device capable of running that, that will get you a sense of how the game plays. There's not a whole heck of a lot of content in the Android app when compared to the, the full board game version, but there's a fair amount. Play around with some of the different fighters, see if you find that variety interesting, and then make a decision about how much you want to spend. Like we said, we just streamed it as well. If, if watching Further, it that way absolutely. is the way you prefer. Then. Further information can be had there. Uh, it's, it's, it's a bit of a shame that it's being rolled out in this way, but I kind of understand why it has to be. And another big question mark has to be, how good is Steamforge Games going to be at fulfilling this project? Because in the past, they've had some very rocky fulfillments, and they have promised to make good on all the people like me who've been left in the lurch for the past few years, and I appreciate that, but they have yet to deliver. So, who knows? That is my revised version of the Street Masters buyer, Buyer's Guide, as it were. If you could have an option to get things a la carte, I'd say, you know, get the the uh, the, the, the base game box and some of the redemption packs, because the redemption packs are awesome. Sadly, though, you can't get them individually. You just get them in these massive buckets. Street Masters 1 and 2 each come with their own redemption packs. So there you go. So, caveat emptor, give it a, give it a look. You have options to try before you're bu- you buy, and I encourage you to take advantage of that if at all possible. And that's the news, and why it doesn't matter. Now, on to the feature game, which is Leonardo's Da Vinci, Codex Lester. This was designed by Chang Hung Beck, Flaminia Bersini, Virginio Gili, and Stefano Luperto and Antonio Tinto, published by Dice Tree Games, which is a uh, Korean publisher which has reprinted a number of Reiner Knizia designs, specifically Winner's Circle and Raw, and has also effectively reprinted Leonardo da Vinci's uh, Codex Lester from the original design by Architoka, which is to say the latter Italian designers. 
uh, which was originally published in 2006 by DV Games. And now, 2006, it's important to remember, was just after the release of Agricola, so this was the early days of worker placement. And it was already novel at the time. Architoca is also known for Igizia and Alma Mater. Uh, they were kind of the Italian masters before the Italian masters were a thing. So this is the, you know, they, they were they were publishing interesting hobby games even before some of the more mainstream releases by uh, people like Simone Luciani, Tommaso Battista, and Daniele Tashini. So Walker, why don't you give us an unhelpful summary about what one does in Codex Lester? So you've been given these drawings, you're inventors, Mark, and you've been given these Leonardo da Vinci drawings, and now you're using them for inspiration to make your own inventions. And you're working on your workshops, you're uh, bringing in robots, you're bringing in robots to help production, and then you can advance these robots. And so you're trying to cycle through all these inventions of different types to get more points and getting resources and... And realizing in the first turn you've made terrible mistakes <laughs> and balancing your workforce. Like I said earlier, you're, you're trying to decide how quickly to bring in workers because you eventually have to pay them. And, and it's, it's, it's area control. It's got so much going on. Leonardo da Vinci. So why is it called the Codex Luster? Well, it was originally called, believe it or not, the Codex Hammer, which is totally a better name. Is that isn't that a like a forty k expansion or something? Uh, no, actually, it was uh, it was my pseudonym when I was an adult film actor. Ah, gotcha. But however, it was uh, purchased by an eighteenth century earl, the Earl of Leicester, and so that's what it was called. It was basically a series of drawing sketches and notes that Leonardo da Vinci made, and they were bound together, and they were eventually sold to Bill Gates in nineteen ninety four for over thirty million dollars at the time. Now, apparently, it's it, it in modern. Uh, dollar redues, it's in excess of $60 million. So by that reckoning, it's the most expensive book ever ever purchased. And we're only talking about uh, 30-ish sheets of, uh, I, I don't know what kind of material Leonardo da Vinci wrote on. And that, that actually, for what it is worth, and it was one of my key criticisms of the reprint of Codex Lester, the drawings, the actual drawings of Leonardo da Vinci of his fabulous inventions are kind of buried and, and difficult to read. It's a bit of a shame. It, it, it was just a little bit neat to actually look and see what the, the crazy, you know, the Leonardo da Vinci tank or the ornithopter or what have you that you're nominally building in these workshops. And it's true. in this the, edition, the, they're the, a little obscure. Yeah, the drawings are there, but they're so washed out. Yeah. I, was thinking, I was thinking earlier today. And small. And small. They gotta, and they, you don't, the cards don't need to have any other, like, they yeah. could be... Anyway, it could be blown up. Yep. There could be interesting sort of lines that go to different parts of the drawing. You know, like they have in a blueprint. And then sure. that's where the resources would be like sort of highlighted. You need brick for this. You need glass oh, for that. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah. And they would like bring out the drawing and and, and it, would, it would bring the theme in more. Sure. Like you are building this. Yeah. And you need these resources because you for these particular parts, you need that. And I think that would have been so much better. Sure. Or they could have just leaned into the robots. <laughs> They could have leaned into the robots. So the key thing for me about Leonardo da Vinci, and one of the reasons why I was initially enthusiastic about the design, was because it riffed on worker placement in a very, very interesting way, years before a lot of other worker placement games decided to do that in an interesting way. Namely, there is sort of an area majority context uh, contest in the worker placement. When you send workers, you, by and large, have to commit how many workers you're sending to a, to a place. But then, when it later comes time to execute the spaces, whoever sent the most workers there gets to do the thing for free. And if you want to do it, and you're, you weren't first, you have to pay victory points, because money is points in Codex Lester. And that makes every financial decision a brutal trade-off. Yeah, and there's sort of two phases to placing workers, right? Because you have a leader. So you, when you when you put workers in a place, you only have that one opportunity. So if you're going to put one or four, you have to put them in at, at that time. And then later on, you can bring your, your leader in there, but it's sort of this timing. It's like, well, I'm going to put it in some other places and try to force other people to place their leaders in other places. And then you can big league and go in and take it over. And then it's got that cycle part after that, which is very interesting. So whoever has the most gets it for zero, then it goes two, three, four. And if people don't want to pay, then it cycles back to the first person. So they have opportunity to go again. And if you're the only person at a workplace, you can use it four times if you have the money. If you're willing to pay nine victory points for that. And given that a typical winning score is often 
in the double digits. Now, granted, the high double digits, but deciding to spend nine on something is a huge investment and it'd better pay off. And so I very much appreciate that kind of risk reward mentality about when to spend and how and when you're okay with being second and when you absolutely need to be first or bust and the calculations that go in that. It's worth emphasizing also that the placement is actually more dynamic in Codex Lester than it was in the original because in the original, sending your workers to your private workshops was an entire separate phase of the game. And so it wasn't interleaved nearly so cleanly as it is in Codex Lester. Yeah, and that's why, anyway, it's part of that timing I talked about. You can sort of waste time by sending uh, workers to your workshop or on the board, and you're so, and so you can see what other players are doing. It's one of these things you, you can sort of time out. Or you send them early because you desperately want to finish the invention first because multiple players are working on the same invention. Yeah, so just a quick brief on how the game works so you can sort of get an idea of what we're talking about. So the very first thing you do is you sort of say, I'm going to try to build these inventions and because there's a big display of, of cycling through inventions. And then you have to show that you have the right resources in order to build them. And then you start doing the worker placement turns where you can put out as many workers you, as you want at, in one area. And then after that, and this, in these phases, this is where you have to, uh, finish your invention. Cause that's a very interesting timing aspect as well. Cause there's lots of sort of out of this round ways that you can f complete the invention or get enough time to complete the invention, but it won't complete unless you do it in this worker placement phase, which is very interesting as well. Yeah. It prevents, it, it makes sure that the competition for timing is as open as possible. And honestly, uh, when it comes to player interaction, Codex Lester isn't the best, but when compared to a lot of other worker placement games, it's vastly more interactive than, than uh, your typical recipe fulfillment worker placement game. So the fact that there is a little bit of tension about when various inventions are going to get completed, and that might determine whether you get a special power and a couple of marginal dollars here or there, that does make things more consequential than they would be otherwise. Yeah, I love the whole work week uh, mechanism as well, because more uh, the bigger the invention, the more money it's going to get you, the longer it'll take to build. And so you say, I'm going to try to build that one, and you put your marker on it. Well, it's, it's going to take 12 weeks. Weeks. And then you have to start funneling workers into your workshops and you have to have enough spaces for them. This all ties into upgrading your workshop by putting robots in there, by putting in more workspaces so you can fit the workers in and then trying to time it out. Like, do I have enough turns left or how many turns is it going to take me to finish this invention so I can get this marker back out again so I can get more. It's that. I have it written here too, is that timing, the sort of the in and the out, right? You don't want yes. to, you don't want to be sitting there with no inventions. You want to be able to cycle, get your timing just right. Absolutely. Yeah. If you plan things poorly, you could end up in a round where you're just not able to start work on anything. Now you can recover from that. Despite the fact that there's only seven rounds, there is the opportunity to, as you joked about at the opening, mess up your first round and then rally. Uh, but generally speaking, you want to make sure you maintain maximum efficiency at all times. And one of the one of the aspects of Codex Lester that's very much calibrated to my preferences is it has just the right amount of planning for my tastes. There are lots of euros where oh, I didn't get that one marginal resource, and consequently n I can't do almost anything this round. Or it is the case that you can just fly by the seat of your pants and get everything done. A lot of your points in Codex Lester might come from completing one of the big 15-week inventions that start out face-up in the game. So there are the rotating cast of inventions that come in the display, but also the big end-game point-scoring ones are visible from the start. So there's a degree of anticipatory planning. And in order to get those done, you need to do some calculations about how your capacity is and not just getting the ingredients together, but making sure that you've got a big enough workshop and you have enough time to get it done. But again, it's not like you have to do some sort of incredible calculatory spreadsheet. It's it's just, it, it's a nice meaty middle for my tastes in terms of pl uh, forward planning. There's even more delay in, delay in there as well, where there are two sort of sections of inventions. One that, ones that you can complete now, and then as they're completed, the other ones cycle down. So if you started to build something that's in the other section, you cannot complete it until it cycles down. So you're sort of trying to waste time and let other people complete them. So yours gets into a position where you're allowed to do that. I love yeah, that. it gives you just enough foreknowledge of what yeah. the display is going to look like later in a couple of turns. 
yeah, the, the time horizon is just right. The level of planning is just right in my experience. And so th- those are some of the things that really mean that Codex, Codex Luster speaks to me and my preferences. So I was wondering, I was going to ask you, sort of like it's not not though the gameplay doesn't is nothing like federation but do you feel as though that every game of codex lester plays out the same that is one of my criticisms of codex lester absolutely right. and i think it's if anything it feels a little bit worse in this edition than than the prior one because one of the things that lester introduces that the original leonardo da vinci did not have is these again very modern sensibility a list of achievements that you can accomplish and every time you accomplish an achievement you unlock a minor benny the problem is, is that two of those achievements are maxing out all of your workshop upgrades, and one of them is getting all your workers out. Consequently, there's a push to max out those spaces, not necessarily right at the beginning, but certainly somewhere in the middle of the game. And consequently, it means that people's development over the course of a, a session end up looking awfully samey. It's not just that that session to session feels more or less the same. It's that a g- different players will develop at roughly the same level. In the original version of Leonardo da Vinci, sometimes you didn't need to bother to go get all your workers, which is too expensive. People are contesting it too much. Whatever. Ignore it. Just make do with less. And since they were fighting over getting more workers, you could afford to do that. Similarly, you might have been able to get by with one heavily upgraded workshop and only do one thing at a time, but do so in, in, in good sequence, or at least it wasn't worth fighting to the same extent. In Codex Lester, because those achievements are there, it is in your interest to maximize all your workers and maximize all your, your workshop upgrades every game. And that lends to the feeling of settling into a rhythm and it getting to, 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 to the same kind of structure. And it does show its age in that sense as well, because it leans into this and it's the drive to get all your workers, it ends up feeling a little bit like that Agricola problem of early worker placement games where, oh, you can get extra workers, you had better get extra workers. Agreed. And then every third turn, I think it is, you have to pay for all your workers. So even those, like Mark said, those players that push out early in the beginning, they might get in some trouble with money because you have to pay for your workers. Yeah, but it's just, you, you push to get out your workers, and that gives you the Achievo that will you know, give you money with which you could pay the workers or get the Chivo that lets you not pay some of your workers. So they end up paying for themselves effectively. So it's not a legitimate trade-off. If, if, if that were, if that had more teeth to it, if you had to pay your workers a lot more, or if there weren't those achievements that offset those costs, either directly or indirectly, then yeah, that might be more of a calculation for oh, first three turns. I'm not going to bother, but then I'm going to make a push to get more workers that I, that I'd probably prefer. And I, I like the fact in the last round, lots of other games just play out the same every round. But in the last round of this game, instead of collecting resources from spaces, you start selling them, right? So in lots of games, you just get points for whatever you have left. In this one, it's like an actual timing thing where you're trying to get to some places before the other players so you can sell your stuff first. I thought that was great. Yet another way in which Codex Luster is calibrated to my preferences is the scoring is aggressively clean. You get points for completing inventions. That's about it. So like over the course of the game, yeah, here and there, you might activate the tile that lets you sell a good or what have you. But the the economy of goods is relatively parsimonious. You're not talking about like, you know, seven wood and five stone to go build this thing. No, no, it's usually like a wood and a rope to go <laughs> finish that invention or something of something like the big end game inventions need four total resources in order to build. So we're not talking about a lot of accounting here. And the end game scoring consists of just looking at the inventions you've built. And that is it. And I I really appreciate it when there's not, you know, you don't have to whip out the score pad. You don't have to worry about cashing in things. It's all taken care of. And part of it as well is in the last round, it's kind of like a competitive end game scoring phase where you're, competing with the worker placement spaces in order to cash in any leftover resources that you've acquired. It's really well done. I like, we've talked about some of the, when you complete invention, you get some bennies sometimes, and some of them are kind of interesting. They're like sort of one-time bonuses that only come with that one particular card. Some are like one time, you know, you can trade in any rope for another resource or switch resources around or get this unique part of your workshop or only a worker that only you can have thought that was kind of neat it it is it's kind of neat i think they could have done more with it it's true that's what i I wish they had done more yeah yeah uh it doesn't fit back in the box (laughs) yeah so uh dice tree games has a, a particular attitude towards overproduction so for example their edition of winter circle has uh pre planted pre painted plastic ponies 
they're actually horses, but that's not quite as alliterative. And they they tend to produce relatively expensive, both because they need to be imported and because of the materials games. And sure enough, uh, Codex Lester has lovely thick double layer boards, which don't really fit in the box. Uh, completely unnecessary poker chip currency, which doesn't really fit back in the box. And this relatively standard Euro custom resources that don't really fit back in the box. I hate that. <laughs> I'm exaggerating. It's it's a couple, it's a centimeter or so of box lift. Yeah. And I should have talked about this when you said the, how easy the end of the game is. End of the round is just as simple. I love the, how the game flows. Hardly any upkeep. It's yeah, just no up, up. You just keep going and the game plays very quickly. I don't know about very quickly. It, it, it's a solid 90 minute Euro game. Uh, for most, uh, for the amount of game that you get. Oh yeah, yeah. Quality decision making. I mean, a, a lot of uh, a lot of other euros with this level of interaction and decision making would definitely stretch into the two hour mark. And I also think that it it scales very well. Uh, so long as you've got at least three, you can play it with two if you wanted to. I wouldn't recommend it because again, the competitive aspects for the worker placement. It's kind of a combined auction slash worker placement slash area majority competition, but it scales up to five very well, and it doesn't drag. Turns are quick, and as you say, the upkeep is is practically non-existent, and so there's just this uh, smooth turnover. And as as Walker would probably say, the flow is real. The flow is real. So I think Leonardo da Vinci, Codex Lester, they've done very good work in terms of the redevelop. I have some quibbles with the graphic design. I have some quibbles with the way the achievements lead to a a, a, a vague sense of repetition. But I really like the core engine. The core engine is so clean and satisfying and dynamic and engaging. The fact that often the peripheral elements about how they implement the engine being less satisfying is something I'm willing to live with. This is absolutely true of a lot of other Architoka designs. I felt this way about Agitzia, for example. Agitzia's got a very, very clever worker placement mechanism with the, with a river, and what you're doing is you're competing over cards that struck me as dull as dirt. And that is that kind of aesthetic is the worst I can say about Codex Lester, but it's much less so. I'm very happy to play. It is not one of the all-time greats of the Euro canon, but I definitely think that it is one of the better releases of last year, and I am very happy to play it every time it hits the table. Yeah, it's unfortunate that you always get to, you know, you're all, we're, right now we're at the point where we're getting all of our workers out, we're getting all the achievements, we're getting the workshops completely upgraded, and so, like we said, it's starting to play out the same every time, and now you're just trying to tweak for the most points, but it's still really fun to play. Yeah, it is an engaging dance for efficiency, but sadly, it redounds to the same dance of efficiency. Yes. So, I think this is the kind of thing, I, I have no idea if this would be easy from a design perspective. It's the kind of thing that an expansion could really possibly help. Just make it so that the horizons of upgrades are a little bit uh, deeper so that you could theoretically max out one, but not both, or you'd have to make some serious trade-offs. As it is, you end up doing a little bit of everything, uh, but you're willing to forgive it because the engine is so good. Different achievements for everyone would totally make that you know what I mean? So you're not maybe. So you're not clearing those spots, like we said, where where half of the action spots are ignored in the later half of the game because everyone's well. I got all my workers out already. Don't right. need that. I've already upgraded my workshop. I don't need that spot. And we've done that because it's an achievement. Whereas if we had different achievements, maybe the sure. focus wouldn't be so much to do that so quickly. And it is worth noting there are still things you can do in those spaces, and those are new elements in Codex Lester as opposed to Leonardo da Vinci. But they're not quite as appealing as the other spaces. So they could have leaned into that a little bit more, I think, in order to do that. Anyway, so very happy to play Codex Lester. I really like seeing the redevelopment they've done. I think it's a, a very, very successful redesign of a very solid worker placement engine. I'd very much like to see the the same approach to worker placement done in different games uh, or perhaps expanded in the in, in the uh, initial one. Happy to play in the future. Would recommend. That is Leonardo da Vinci's Codex Lester by Chang Hing Beck, Flamini Bersini, Virginio Gili, Stefano Luperto, and Antonio Tinto, the latter f uh, four of whom are called Architoka, published by Dice Tree Games of 2023. So that's going to do it for this week for So Very Wrong About Games. Thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate it a great deal. You can find all our information, contact and otherwise at SoWrongGames.com. We would love to hear from you. We'll get back to you if we can. Thank you again for tuning in. Please take care of yourself. Enjoy your hobby time and take care of each other. Hope to see you again soon. Peace! You've been listening to So Very Wrong About Games, produced by Michael Walker and edited by Mark Bigney. 
Special thanks goes to What Does It Eat for generously allowing us to use their most excellent song, FOS, as our theme. You can find them at whatdoesiteat.com. You can reach us by email at soverywrongaboutgames at gmail.com or on Twitter at sowronggames. Thanks very much. See you next time. And always, try to be right, but remember you are so very wrong. <laughs>